1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to begin reading in verse 1 in just a moment. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse number 1, and we're just going to read the first two verses, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and uh, verse number 1. If you remember, back in the Gospel of Luke, we're not going to turn there, um, but back in the Gospel of Luke, excuse me, you remember before uh, the Lord Jesus went to the cross, uh, he instructed Peter there in the Gospel of Luke. And uh, Peter, of course, said, I'm going to go with you all the way. Uh, you know, I, I'm going all the way uh, to the cross with you. And... Uh, Jesus told him, he said, Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And he said, when thou art converted, he gave this instruction to Peter, said, strengthen the brethren, strengthen the brethren. And so Peter is going to pin down two letters here. He's going to pin down this first epistle that we're going to look at, and of course the second epistle. This first epistle is written primarily to those who are going to endure suffering. And we'll talk more about that this evening for a little bit. The second epistle was more to point out and to warn and to guard against false prophets. Uh, but he's writing both these letters, and both these letters are to uh, strengthen the brethren. This first one, uh, to those who are suffering, if you notice verse 1, he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ... To the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect or according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit and to obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Now he's writing to these believers. He's writing to people who are enduring suffering. They're enduring some form of persecution as he writes to them, I think about what would I write, and you can think about tonight, what would you write to people who are enduring suffering, uh, to people who are under persecution? I, I think the natural the, the thing that comes to our minds, especially as a, as a believer, as a Christian, we want to bring encouragement, right? We want to bring hope. Uh, we want to bring comfort. And, uh, of course, Peter does that, I believe, in this first letter. We're going to look at it. He, he does that. But as we go through this letter, we're going to find out that Peter's words are not just words of comfort, encouragement, hope, but they also maybe can be a little bit surprising to us, maybe a little bit shocking to us at what Peter is going to tell these believers. Now, some interesting things. First of all, think about the... Man, Peter, think about this man who is the human penman of this book. You know, you just think about his, he, he, him as a person and all that we know about Peter and how uh, Peter often put his foot in his mouth, right? A lot of times. Uh, Peter was always one who was ready to go. You know, he was always one who was, it seemed like he was the, the, the first one ready to do whatever it is that was going to be done. He was, he was right there at it. But we also think about Peter as the man who denied the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Uh, he denied him there. Instead of going with him all the way to the cross, he denied him. But as you begin this letter, he says, Peter, and then the next words, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Well, right there, just that statement that's given right there uh, points not only to the fact that Peter is a changed human being, uh, uh, that there's a transforming work that's taken place in Peter's life. It's a testimony to those he's writing to that God can transform their life. And God has, as believers, transformed their life. Peter, I mean, just the name should cause us to celebrate the grace of God and what took place even in his own life and what God's grace is able to do in the life of any uh, individual. But as we think about the content and where this letter is going to go, not only encouragement, but also some, some shocking and surprising things. Because it's more than just a letter of hope. It's more than just a letter of, uh, of, of comfort. As we're going to look at, we're going to find out that this book, this letter is a call to action. 
It's a call to action to those who are enduring persecution, to those who are enduring suffering. These are, if you will, these are marching orders that are given. These are fighting words, may we might say. Fighting in the right spirit, of course. Having a good testimony of those within and those without, I believe. But I, I, I thought about and was praying about and seeking direction of the Lord where, where to go next in preaching and in the next series of messages I wanted to bring. And God kept bringing me back to this letter to First Peter. I think about what's going on in our nation and quite literally what's going on around the world. And there are those who are enduring more suffering and more trouble and more persecution than, than we are here in this location. But I think about God's word to us. What is it that God wants to tell us in this time in which we're going through right now? I think about this. I think this is exactly... What those who are suffering, this is what they need to hear. This is the Word of God. They need to hear what God has said. What is it that suffering does when you endure trouble and you endure difficulty and you endure suffering? What often happens when we get disappointed about things in life, when we get discouraged, when we get hurt, when we're afraid, when we're fearful, when we get ill? What is the temptation often in those times in our life? Well, the temptation very often is to turn inward, right? It's to start thinking about ourselves, to become uh, focused on ourselves and, and to become uh, very much uh, self-aware and self-possessed. If you will, we suffer our own suffering. We suffer our own suffering. Somebody said this, we get really good at troubling our own trouble. Troubling our own trouble. So Peter does something here and it shows the wisdom of God as he writes this letter. He takes suffering people and the difficulties that are going on in their lives and he gives them something that all of us need. He gives them a vision of something greater than the things that they're going through. And we all need that. We need a vision of that which is greater that goes outside of ourselves. A vision of something greater that is happening. He, he calls them, first and foremost in these opening verses, He calls them to think about what they have, what they have been brought into by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives them a, a vision. He gives them a calling for every part of their lives because in that, in that calling, there's hope and there's comfort. We have this tendency when, when things get difficult, when things get hard, when trouble comes and difficulty comes, we, we begin to think sometimes, well, our world has come to an end as we know it. But what we need to do is we need to get up and do what God has called us to do. There's still a need. God is still on the throne. Well, if that was the case in the first century to these believers to whom Peter is writing to, that's the case in the 21st century today as well. There's still much to be done for the Lord Jesus Christ. Look again at what he says in these opening verses. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These are cities there in Asia Minor. Then he says this, elect, and don't let that word scare you, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Don't let that phrase scare you. Through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Peter's giving us really something that's going to be a theme that runs throughout his entire letter. He's laying a foundation. What is he doing in these opening verses? He is reminding them, he is saying, this is who I am writing to, and I want to remind you of who you are. I want to remind you of your position, if you will. Why does he do that? Because often troubled people or suffering people forget. They forget. The pain, whatever it is that's going through, whatever looms large in our life, the difficulty, the, the tribulation, the trouble, it produces in us what, what has been called an identity amnesia. You forget who you are. So Peter starts, and he starts right away, and he starts reminding them as they're going through this difficulty, as they're going through this suffering, as they're going through this persecution, this is who you are. Remember who you are as a child of God because suffering people tend... To forget. 
they tend to forget. He writes to those, he says here in verse 1, to the strangers that are scattered, and he gives these cities throughout Asia Minor, and he lines them up, if you will, if you were going to go visit them or make a trip, if you will, you'd, you'd line the cities up just like Peter lined them up here in verse number 1. Uh, you'd go to each one as you're going to make a journey, if you will. And he's writing to, I believe he's writing to Jewish believers, but not just Jewish believers, there's Gentile believers there as well. And they're enduring suffering. They're enduring persecution for who uh, uh, they are following. That's the person of Jesus Christ. So there's some uh, mixed congregation, Jew and Gentile alike. I mentioned to you this morning before we left out of here, I said, uh, how many of you uh, know uh, what I'm talking about when I say Social Security? And I think all of us in this room, maybe some of the young people may not know it as much as uh, we adults know it and understand what it is. But I said... Uh, 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 you, you know something about it. You've paid something into it, right? You're expecting at some point to get something out of it. I don't know what it'll be, but uh, something out of it, right? But where is real security to be found? Where is it to be found? Where do I look for well-being? What's going to provide stability? Well, not the IRS, right? What's going to provide real stability when the things around me are, aren't stable? And would, wouldn't you say the things around us don't seem to be very stable at all? Now, sometimes we might say, and you've heard preachers say, well, if you're not in one of these situations, you will be. And it seems like we're all in a bit of a situation, right, as a country. But there's other things, right? Sometimes it's job loss. Sometimes it is physical illness that, that comes. Sometimes it's financial difficulty. Sometimes it's struggle with uh, 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 friends or struggle in a, in a family, whatever the case may be. But somehow, some way, our world gets disordered. And where do we find real stability? Well, security is found in one place, and that's what Peter is bringing these believers back to, these Jews and Gentiles that have been scattered because of persecution. He's bringing them back to, your security is not found in your circumstances. It's not found in your finances. It's not found in your friends. It's not even found in your family. Your security is found in one place. It's found in your relationship to Jesus Christ. It's found in your Savior. Notice the words he uses. He says, to the strangers scattered throughout. The strangers scattered throughout. And then he uses a term in verse number 2. He says, they are elect. They're, they're strangers and they're elect strangers. What are those? Those are terms of identity. They've been scattered. They're elect. That, means they're, that just means they're, they're believers. In other words, he's saying, don't you understand something? Another way to say it is that you are chosen aliens. You're chosen aliens. Can I tell you something? As believers, that's really what we are on this world. We are chosen aliens. We are elect strangers. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue, right? Have you thought about the fact that as God's child, you are called to some things? First of all, what are we called to? We're called to cross-cultural living. Cross-cultural living. So what do you mean, Pastor? I mean, this world truly is not my home. It, it, as a believer, it's not the comfortable place that it once was because now I'm called to operate by the Lord Jesus Christ by a different set of rules, different than what this world has set forth. My heart should be motivated by a different set of motivations. I should have a different king than what this world has. In other words, my goal is not just to set up my own idea of how life should go, if you will, my own little, uh, little kingdom, hoping that I can get enough control to get things that I want. No, I've been welcomed into a, another kingdom. I'm the citizen of another kingdom. And there should be times in life when I realize I just don't fit in to this kingdom of this world. I just don't fit in. We're, we're operating by a different set of standards, a different set of rules. Think about it. We were chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ. The moment that we 
asked God to forgive us of our sin and by faith came Christ as Savior. We became one of the chosen ones, right? And we're chosen to live differently. The Bible tells us about it in Romans chapter 8. We're not going to take the time to turn there, but we, we've been predestined to be conformed to the image of His dear Son, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8. I am not of this world. I am in this world. I'm living in this world, but I'm not of this world. In other words, I'm blessed to be, if you will, by this world. I'm blessed to be just a little bit weird. And you as a believer are too. We're blessed to be just a little bit weird. We get misunderstood, don't we? It, the normal way the world operates is not how we should operate. The, the world doesn't understand how we operate. We've been welcomed into the kingdom of God. By the way, we shouldn't mourn the difference. Let me say that again. We shouldn't mourn the difference. We should be grateful to God for that. We shouldn't hide the difference. It should be a testimony to all. I, I shouldn't wish that I fit in more out there. No, I shouldn't wish for that. The cross-cultural existence is a sure sign of the fact that transforming grace has been given to me. I've been transformed by the grace of God. It's a wonderful thing that my heart grieves at places where other people's hearts don't grieve. In other words, my heart grieves about things that maybe doesn't bother those who do not know Christ. My heart grieves about it. My heart rejoices at places where other people's hearts outside of the family of God, they don't rejoice. It's a wonderful thing that what's important to me and to you is what's not important to those outside. What, all, what is all of that? All of that is the work of grace, the grace of God. One preacher says, it is uncomfortable grace. It is uncomfortable grace. It's not easy to be an alien. It's not easy to be an alien. But it's grace. It's grace. Look back again in our passage in 1 Peter chapter 1. Notice what he says there. He says, elect what? According to the foreknowledge of God the Father. God placed His love on us before the foundation of the world were set in place. Now you think about that. It's hard to think about because... <laughs> It's hard for us to think about eternity, isn't it? We had a beginning, right? We're celebrating birthdays for the month of August, right? And we had, we had a, a day that we, were, that we were born, a day that we were uh, uh, brought into this world. And if the Lord Jesus Christ tarries His coming, uh, there's a day that we're leaving out of this world. And all, both those dates have already been predetermined, right? God already knows them. He has that, what we're talking about right there. He has what you and I don't have. He has, he has foreknowledge. But God placed His love on us before the foundation of the world was ever set in place, before God ever created uh, uh, the universe, before He ever spoke it into existence, before He ever put man on planet Earth. He already had us in His heart. He already loved us. So here's a, here's a third thing. You have a father who knows you and knows everything about you. you. Say, wait a minute, Pastor, I missed the second thing. Well, you're called to cross-cultural living. Transforming grace has been given to you. And the third thing is this. You have a father who knows you and knows everything about you. So what do you mean? You have a father who's written every aspect of your life because every aspect of your life is connected to the operation of the grace of God. And the final completion of the work that he's seeking to do in us. You think about that expression, the foreknowledge of God the Father. We think about that. We often think about God knows what we do not know in salvation. But it goes more than that. Foreknow means to set one's love on a person or persons in a personal way. He set his love on us before the foundation of the world in a personal way. You and me, he had us already thousands of years, eternity before. It's hard to imagine, it's hard to comprehend, but he already had us in mind. All of us. Every last one of us. 
Now, think about this, though. The work of God is progressive, right? It's progressive. The work of God covers my whole life. It's not just, it's not just look, I have a beginning point, right? I have a beginning, and that's when I come to know Christ as Savior. But it doesn't stop there. The foreknowledge of God, God placing his, his love upon me and sending His only begotten Son to go to the cross of Calvary doesn't end there at the moment of salvation. It continues all throughout my life. It moves all the way through my life. It's something bigger. What I'm saying is it's something bigger. It's more than just my salvation. It's my entire life as His child. He has it all set out. What, what am I saying? I'm saying everything that you and I face, whatever it is, covid finances, job, you mark it down, whatever it is. It doesn't matter what it is. Everything I face, I can say, my father knows this. He knows all about it. Wherever I find myself, geographically, my father knows my location. My father knows my situation. My father knows the circumstances. My, my father knows what's going on with me. He knows all of that. All that I am, all that I face, all the difficulties, it's already been written in his book. He already knows it all. Think about this. You will never, if you're a God's child, step out of the circle of the knowledge of your father. So what do you mean? I mean, nothing will ever come to your life that your father didn't already know. Nothing. He knew all about it. I, I maybe never knew anything about it. I didn't see it coming. Maybe to me it was like it was blindsided and I wonder what happened. But God's not blindsided. Doesn't it encourage your heart that 2020 did not take God by surprise? It didn't take God by surprise at all. Everything that's taking place, every last thing, never took Him surprise one bit. Our Father knows he knows the things that, that trouble us. He knows the things that we don't understand anything about. He understands them all. The things that are hard to stand. He is working all those things out. He's working them out according to His purpose. We need to know that our Father knows. He knows. Now, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden life immediately makes sense to me now. Because I understand that there are times when life doesn't make sense. Those moments when we don't understand, we can't see. It's hard, it's hard to, to see, if you will, uh, His love. It's hard to understand His purpose. Moments where it looks like evil is winning. Looks like that in our society today, doesn't it? Looks like evil is winning. But we can comfort ourselves with the fact that my Father knows all about it. The one who set the direction of my life, long before I took my first breath, He knows it all. He's in control of it all. Think about this. The power of sin has been broken. The power of sin has been broken, is broken, done away with, when Christ went to the cross and He came out of the grave alive forevermore. The power of sin defeated. He says, I have the keys to what? Death, hell, and the grave, right? The power of sin is broken. It is right now, currently, at this moment, broken. But you and I still live in this fallen world, right? And the presence of sin, my, it is evident, isn't it? The presence of sin still remains. By the way, the presence of sin gave evidence this week in my life. Can I dare say this to you? The presence of sin gave evidence in your life this week too. It gave evidence by words you spoke Choices you made, thoughts you had, desires, struggles, conflict. Maybe those were in the private moments when nobody knew anything about what was going on. Maybe those were out open in the public where everybody heard them. But you demonstrated in that that sin is still present. It's still present. Look what... Peter writes here in verse number 2, not as he say, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through, notice, sanctification of the Spirit. That progressive work that the Spirit is seeking to do in our lives. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. What is your identity? 
What is your identity? Are you someone who just would say, you know, I'm, I'm struggling, I'm struggling with this sin, and somehow, some way, I'm, I'm going to get over it one day. I'm going to see it defeated one day. Is that where you're living? Well, can I tell you something? If you're a child of God, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, it, it, the fact of the matter is the Spirit of God has come to you. He indwells you. He lives inside of you. And Paul says there is a battle that is raging, correct? Look with me, if you would, in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. We're not doing a lot of turning tonight. We're just pretty much staying in these first two verses, but we will turn here. Galatians chapter 5. Familiar passage. Paul exhorts these believers in the region of Galatia in verse 16. He says, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But then verse 17 he says, For the flesh lusteth. Now the idea there is war, battle, attack. That's the idea of that word lusteth. The flesh lusteth or warreth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. There is a, a battle royal that is waging. And these are contrary. They're opposite the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. And Paul gave evidence of that in his own life back in Romans chapter 7. We're not going to turn back there, but you could go back there and read it and how there was a battle in his own life. Back and forth. Flesh against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. They were warring one against the other. And the Holy Spirit is warring. He's battling on our behalf. So I'm not just a person as a believer tonight. I'm not just a person who has to sit back and say, well, I'm, I'm struggling with sin and then one day I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to see it defeated, you know. If I'm a child of God, I am being progressively transformed by the grace of God. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, Paul wrote. In other words, he's not going to turn away from that work until we have been fully transformed in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. When I enter into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, thank God I'm going to be free. The progressive work will finally be done because I'm going to be free from the very presence of sin. I'm glad the moment I trusted Christ as Savior, the penalty of sin, I'm not dying and going to hell. I was a child of the devil, but now I'm a child of God. I, I am being saved progressively. Right now, the power of sin is being broken in my life by the Spirit of God who indwells me. I don't have to walk around in the dumps. I don't have to walk around and say, I'm just struggling with this. I can never get over this. No, no, I don't have to walk around that way. I have the power through the Spirit of God to see that overcome in my life. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And one day, one day, thank the Lord, I'm praying it's through the rapture and I'm praying it soon. Even so come Lord Jesus. And John said we ought to pray that way, right? We ought to pray that way. Hey, everything on my bucket list could go out the window. Make no mistake about it. Oh yeah, I've got things that I'd, I'd like to do while I'm alive on this earth. But look, all those things go out the window if I can see Jesus. Any greater thing than seeing Jesus? I can't think of any. Can't think of any of all. And when I see him, whether it's through the rapture, whether it's through the door of death, whichever it's going to be, the fact of the matter is that I'll be free from the very presence of sin. You know, aren't you glad of that? Gone. What's well, that's, that's something to look forward to. Isn't it? Gone from the very presence of sin. What does that mean? Well, that means right now, in the here and now, in which we're living, still dealing with the presence of sin in this world that we live in. What, what about families? What about marriages? Husbands and wives? It means there's, a, there's hope for marriage. There's hope. The transforming power of the Spirit of God is working... On our behalf. There's hope for difficult relationships. The Spirit of God is working on our behalf. There's hope for, for difficulties that we might have in our thought life and our, our desires. There's hope there. The transforming power of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's hope for those besetting sins. The power of the Lord Jesus Christ in behalf of the Holy Spirit of God working in our life. In other words, what am I saying? I'm saying, look, you're not in this alone. You're not fighting this battle alone. God has come to us. The Spirit of God, the Comforter, 
He, he's not going to leave us. He's not going to forsake us. He lives inside of us. He, he battles. He wars on our behalf, transforming us by His grace. If you look back there in 1 Peter, maybe you've turned away. 1 Peter chapter 1, notice what he says. He says, not only elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, but he says, unto obedience. Unto obedience. So I've been called to, to cross-cultural living. I've been transformed. Trans, transforming grace has been given to me, gifted to me. I have a Father who knows all things, everything that's going to take place. But then I've been called to a new and a, a, if you will, a radical way of living. What I mean by radical, I, I mean no longer controlled by me. No longer ruled by my emotions and, and my desires. No longer trying to sit on the throne of my life as sovereign. No, I've been called to submit everything. Yield everything. And everything I do to the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that call is the, the highest honor that could possibly be given. To submit it all to the Lord Jesus Christ. I was reading in preparation for this this past week. And I was reading about an illustration that was given. And uh, there's two brothers and they're both preachers. And the one was talking to the other one. And he told his brother this. He said, you'll never understand God's call to obey until you understand obedience is itself a reward. That just stood out to me. You'll never understand God's call to obey until you realize that obedience itself is a reward. It's a reward. You see, I'm, as a Christian, as a believer, I'm one of God's children. I'm one of those ones that, that John talked about in John 1, 12. As many as received. Him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. I've been called. I'm one of the chosen ones to be a part of what He's doing on this earth. I think probably just about everybody in this room would say that as well. I've been liberated from my own uh, uh, agenda, bondage to that agenda, my own self-sovereignty, my way. Just that deliverance in and of itself that's grace. That's the grace of God. So what motivates the actions that I take and that you take? Is it the Lord Jesus Christ Himself and His authority and His sovereignty? Is it the clear calling of His Word? Do I obey Him and what He has said because it is a sense of privilege? I belong to the King of kings and Lord of lords. I am one of His children. It's a privilege to obey Him. Notice what he says. At the end of this verse, verse 2, he says, not only unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's sacrificial language. That's the image of, of cleansing and forgiveness. By the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we stand before God as righteous. Not in our own righteousness. Now, the presence of sin, we're people who are in daily need of cleansing. And that, that's not to say that we, we lose our salvation or something. That, that, that's not it at all. Uh, but John put it this way in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. By the way, who was John writing to? He was writing to believers. A daily need of cleansing. Really, those are words of hope because it doesn't matter how, how difficult my, my problems are or how great my failure might be or... How weak I am. There is ongoing forgiveness. There is ongoing cleansing. It doesn't stop. The cleansing wave I see, I see, I plunge. And oh, it cleanseth me. Oh, praise the Lord, it cleanseth me. It cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. Isn't that a great truth in that hymn? Just keeps on going. I don't have to run in fear from the presence of God. Why? Because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. As Peter wrote, the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't have to run in fear. Difficulty comes, trouble comes, temptations come, 
uh, uh, tribulations come, and there's a choice that is to be made, right? It either, it either brings people into the presence of the Lord, or they run from the presence of the Lord. So let me compel you this evening. Let me compel you if you're watching or listening. Run to the Lord. Don't run from Him. Receive His forgiving, re forgiveness. Receive His cleansing. Are we running? Are we hiding? We can hide in guilt. Sometimes we cower or recover in, in shame. Do we run away from the only place of forgiveness and the only place of deliverance? Think about this identity. Think about your identity. If you're a Christian tonight, if you know Christ as Savior. I've been chosen to be a part of the operation of this kingdom that is not of this world. Jesus even said that. If, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my soldiers fight, right? A heavenly kingdom. I'm the son, and there are some daughters in here as well of a father who knows because he has written my life out. I'm the object of his unyielding and his transforming grace. He's not going to relent till that work is done. I've been chosen to be a part of something bigger than just the borders of my own life. Bigger than that. To come to the place to submit everything I am and submit everything I have to the Lord Jesus Christ. And He gives continual forgiveness and continual cleansing. Let me ask you a question. Do you, do I, do we live do we live like we believe this? Do we live like we believe this? This is what Scripture teaches. Do we live like we believe it? Do I live? Do you live like this is really my identity? This is who I am in Christ Jesus. Husbands, does this shape the way you respond to your wife? Even those difficult moments, those intense moments that every marriage has. Wives, do you embrace the identity so when you are hurt by something or someone, maybe even your husband by what he said or what he's done, and you want to lash out and you want to hurt him in the way he's hurt you, how do you respond? Do you embrace this identity? Do you embrace this identity when you've lost something dear to you? Or when you don't know how you're going to meet certain needs. Or you wonder, what in the world is God doing? Why is He allowing this to happen in my life? Do we as parents, parents in this room, do we grab hold of this identity when we have a child who seems unyielding and unwilling to be obedient? Do we grab hold of this identity when we feel all alone in the workplace because the things that the people in the workplace, do and speak about and plan on are not things that we are going to do and speak about and plan on. And does this identity, does it give you rest that you can go home tonight and you can lay your head on your pillow and you can say, my father knows all about it. His grace his grace is evident in my life. He's not going to quit doing this sanctifying work until the job's completed. I am blessed because I can come to Him daily for cleansing and daily for forgiveness. My world can get disordered, but I have security. Why? Because I am a child of God. May the grace of these truths and the peace that passeth all understanding that we find in these truths, may it be multiplied in our lives. May it be real, may it be true, day after day after day. May we not be uh, uh, those who have identity amnesia. We forget who we are, because suffering people forget who they are. Will we not seek security in other places? We'll seek security in our Heavenly Father, what He's provided for us. Rest in the grace that we've been given. Grace that will complete its work and give us peace. You see, I believe this. I believe our lives are like the lives of the people that 
Peter is writing this letter to. What do you mean? I mean, they lived in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. They suffered in various ways. We suffer. Maybe not to their extent, but we suffer. There's moments when we get misunderstood and we're mocked. We get persecuted or spoken ill of, at least, for our allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. In those moments, it's easy to give way to doubts and discouragement and fear, what-ifs, to forget who we are and our identity in Christ Jesus. But we ought to stop and thank God that we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We are aliens in this world, strangers and pilgrims. Thank God that He knows every detail of our lives. All of it has been written down. All of it is, is in His book. And we are the objects of ongoing, transforming grace. Oh yeah, we still struggle with sin. As long as I'm in this flesh, I'm going to do that. But there's daily forgiveness and daily cleansing. He's given us something bigger to live for than ourselves. And He's called us, as the Bible says here, in verse 2, unto obedience. And He says, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. And may it be again and again and again as we rest in Him. Let's bow our heads together. Heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We're going to pray together in just a moment. I wonder tonight, maybe you would say, you know, Pastor, the truth of the matter is I've had a little bit of that identity amnesia. I've struggled a little bit with that. And I don't know what's going on in your life, personally. I don't know what the difficulty may be. But you'd say tonight, you know, I've, I've struggled with that. I have. I'm struggling with that now and... God has got my attention here to remember who I am in Him and what I have in Him and that I am His child. I am secure in Him. He thinks on me. He's thought on me. He set His love upon me from the foundation, from before the foundation of the world. And Pastor, would you pray for me tonight? I've, I'm dealing a little bit with this identity amnesia. And I need to realize my spiritual, not my social security, but my spiritual security is bound up in the person of Christ. And God has dealt with me about that. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Say, Pastor, would you remember me tonight? Would you lift your hand hold it high? Anyone like that at all? Amen. 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 I want to encourage you, if God has touched your heart, Spend some time with Him in prayer. Think about these truths. We are in this world, but not of this world. It ought to be evident. The transforming grace of God has been given to us. It ought to grieve us. Things that are going on in this world that are against the truth, it ought to grieve us, shouldn't it? We ought to stand out this a little bit. I'm not saying you intentionally make yourself try to stand out. There are people who do that type of thing. I'm not saying that. I'm saying just in your, your, your living, your living for Christ, you ought to stand out. Take comfort that you have a Father who knows you. He knows everything about you. And then ask God to help you to live this new way of living, this new way of living, submitting to Him in everything. Lord Jesus, Thank you for your word and the truth of your word. May it change our lives. Lord, as we look in it and as we examine it and we study it, may it permeate our minds. May it change the way we live. May we not just, as we talked about this morning, may we not just always move about in default mode. May we be allowing the transforming grace of God to continue to do that progressive work each day, each day more Christ-like, each day. 
Help us to be obedient to You. Help us not to grieve Your Holy Spirit or quench it, but to allow You to do the work that You desire to do. Have Your will and win this invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. God has spoken to your heart. Why don't you just make your seat and altar there before the Lord? Maybe just want to thank Him. Thank Him that somebody got to you the, with the gospel. That you are one of the elect because somebody got to you with the gospel and you recognize your sinful condition and you ask God to forgive you of your sin and by faith you trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. And so you are. You don't have to worry about whether you're one of the elect or not. If you've received Christ, you are. You are one of the chosen ones. Everyone who receives Christ, repents of their sin and receives Christ as one of the chosen ones. this way. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate your attentiveness and the faithfulness in the meeting tonight. Let's recognize the uh, birthdays and anniversaries for August, those who are present. So if you had a birthday, or will have, tomorrow will be the last day, <laughs> would you stand? All right, very good. We'll start up here with Lily. August the 10th. All right, Logan. 22nd. All right, very good. Seventh, all right. Did I miss anybody else in between you all? I don't think I did anywhere. Oh, yes, upstairs. Seventeenth, okay, Ethan, very good. Uh, the Beatles? Okay, very good. Anybody else? I don't think so. All right, let's sing happy birthday to these folks. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. All right, very good. You can have a seat unless there's an anniversary. You have an anniversary in August. August anniversaries. Okay, very good. The Pettits have an anniversary. I think she's waiting on you. Fourth. The fourth. How many years? Uh oh. <laughs> what was it? 19, okay. <laughs> Sorry, you put the sound man on the spot tonight. Uh, Mr. Crowder? 41 years. Amen, that's great. That's great. Oh, I'm sorry, Wendy. Yep. The fifth. Fifth, how many years? 20. 20 years. Very good. That's great. I miss anybody else. These folks that help us, I miss them sometimes, you know, different things. They're easier to see because they're right in front of me. All right, very good. Well, let's sing happy anniversary to these folks. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. All right, very good. Let's all stand together. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. God bless you for being here. I trust you have a good week in the Lord. And uh, pray for these young people here at our academy and our teachers as they head back. Uh, to school this week. How many of you have already, you're not a part of this academy, but you've already headed back? Uh, anybody else here? I thought Cassidy's already went back. Yep. And I think we have some others. I think the, the older two work boys, I think, started back already as well. And uh, very good. All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Again, God bless you. We will dismiss from back uh, to front again. Uh, Brother Scott Beetle, would you dismiss us in prayer, please?